What's up, everybody? Welcome to another primary source walkthrough. This time, we are going to dive into George Fitzhugh's argument that slavery is better than liberty and equality. Uh, this is from his uh, book um, slash newspaper thing. Uh, let's call it a project um, called Sociology for the South. Um, Fitzhugh is a weird guy. Um, he basically dedicated his entire life to the study of slavery. Um, and we're not just talking about, uh, slavery in the, uh, United States. We're talking about slavery throughout the world at all different times. Like if there was a book or article or whatever about slavery, chances are that George Fitzhugh read it. Um, he lived in this kind of rundown, not very well taken care of, uh, giant, like, house mansion thing. Uh, and, and all he did was, like, read and write. Um, and sometimes, uh, most of the time, uh, he didn't put his name to it, uh, so it just looked like anonymous. Um, and so Abraham Lincoln at one point actually... Uh, thought that um, George Fitzhugh's writing was just a whole bunch of different people from all over the South instead of just one guy in, uh, in his basement um, Twitter trolling the whole world, you know? It's kind of funny. Uh, maybe the only thing that's funny about this. So, um, Fitzhugh, you know, again, we have to read this with the, the Hammond... Um, defense of slavery it, it goes within that genre like you know why is slavery so important for the south and how can they uh, justify the system that we identify rightly as cruel and unusual and inhuman and all of that you know like people fought a war to try to protect this institution um and we've got to try to figure out, you know, like what motivated them, what what could possibly uh, convince people that this was a, a good thing. So, uh, in, in this uh, selection, what Fitzhugh, like the title suggests, is going to argue is that slavery is actually better than freedom or liberty and equality. So let's jump in and see why he says so. So where he opens up is he says that liberty and equality are new things. Uh, and that slavery is the norm. It, he's not wrong. Um, almost every society up until uh, the 19th century uh, had some form of slavery. Uh, in the West, uh, the Greeks had slavery. Uh, even the quote-unquote freedom-loving Spartans that we romanticize in this country, they were the worst slavers of them all. Um, their whole state depended on slavery. Uh, you should not celebrate the Spartans. They were awful. And if you do celebrate the Spartans and you're like, what are you talking about, uh, Dr. Hevert? Uh, the Spartans are the best. Um, you need to do more research. They're awful. Uh, and I encourage you to, uh, to look deeper. Uh, and read some real historical sources. They were, um, they were awful, just awful. Um, Rome had slaves, a lot of slaves. There were, uh, there there weren't slaves like we mean slaves in the Middle Ages, uh, in, in well, in the 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 early Middle Ages in uh, in Europe. I, we call them serfs instead. And even that's a little bit sticky. It's a completely different system um, where you have oaths and labor. It's a little bit more confusing. It's unfree labor. So if we want to be as general as possible, we could call it slavery. Um, there's slavery in the Islamic world. There's slavery in the Chinese world, uh, in Central Asia, in the Americas. There's slavery um, in Africa, there's slavery. Um, it, it's everywhere. So, uh, Fitzhugh isn't wrong about that. And he says that we, uh, the United States, are fairly unique 
uh, in our experiment with liberty. Um, France, he says, is, is another one that, uh, that did away with it. And he says that this experiment has failed. Um, that with slavery gone, um, there's been more crime and poverty. That's what pauperism means. So, uh, he says, we have conclusive proof that liberty and equality have not conduced to enhance the comfort or the happiness of the people. So, freedom and equality has failed. Crime and pauperism, poverty, uh, have increased. Riots, trade unions, strikes for higher wages, discontent breaking out into a revolution. These happen every day. And uh, <clears throat> if uh, slavery existed in the North or in France, people would be a whole lot happier. And again, he's making this connection in the next paragraph that where we see liberty and equality, we see a rise in poverty and crime. Um, he gives us no data for this. I mean, he's not, you know, a uh, 21st century political scientist and show, shows us data. Um, I don't think that's necessarily true. I think even in uh, places where there is a lot of slavery, there still is pauperism and crime. There's still poverty and crime. Not everybody was a super rich slaveholder in the South. Let's keep that in mind. So, um, he he says that when where there is not slavery, and where there is liberty and equality, the poor are going to go to war against each other. And he doesn't say this in like a real physical way. Like they're not going to line up uh, on two sides of a battlefield and shoot guns at each other. What he means is there's going to be. Um, a uh, price war for labor so they war with one another in the race of competition it's all about employment so what he's saying is that in a free market um you have a you have labor that needs to be done and you have a labor force that can supply that labor and he says that there is a lot more population than there is labor so what he's saying is because we have so many people, there isn't enough work for them to do. Uh, so this drives the price of labor down. So people can't, you know, like people can't get as much as, as they're worth. Um, he also uh, says uh, some interesting things about women and children here. Um, he's talking about how there's this kind of, uh, beginning of a, a groundswell for, uh, women's, uh, opportunity and women's rights, etc. And, um, what he says, uh, is that, uh, women should not be working. We should not set them free, um, because they're children. This is, that's what he's saying right here. Uh, but half of mankind are grown-up children, uh, and liberty would be fatal to them. So that, that's a whole nother uh, can of worms um, that isn't necessarily connected to our, our, our thoughts on slavery, but you know, keep that in mind. He's willing to go there. All right. So um, he continues, and he says, uh, the most important question is how does slavery affect the slave? Um, and he goes on this kind of weird, tan like, it, it seems weird to us, um, where he starts talking about communism. Um, this is from the, uh, the 1850s. This is 1854. Uh, so, you know, th this isn't like Leninism or Stalinism because that's 20th century. Like this is probably like pure unadulterated Marx. Uh, and even then, man, that, that's a, when did Marx write the communist manif manifesto? I should know that off the top of my head, but I don't memorize dates. Um, yeah, it's around this time. So, uh, maybe that's what he's talking about here. 
Let me look at the date for the Communist Manifesto. Okay, uh, 1848. So this, yeah, I would imagine that he's probably reading Marx here um, and maybe reading uh, Das Kapital uh, in addition to uh, the uh, Communist Manifesto. Let me see the date on Das Kapital. Um, no, it would have been too late. That doesn't happen until 1867 uh, for volume one. In any case, um, what he's saying here is uh, he, he, you have to, div what, let me back up. So what you, as the reader of this, uh, document have to do is you cannot read our understanding of communism into this. This is why I'm, I'm talking about Marx. Um, this is not... He doesn't understand communism the way that you and I understand communism. That We see communism through the lens of Lenin and Stalin and Mao uh, and... Um, Ho Chi Minh uh, and uh, the, the Kims in North Korea uh, and Fidel Castro, uh, which is also colored by uh, the ideology of the Cold War, um, which he doesn't have. Again, he's writing this in 1854. Um, so what he means by communism here is, is not... Um, the communism that, that we were thinking of. So what he's going to say is he's saying like, look, the South, the Southern plantation is the bow ideal of communism. He's saying it's the best form of communism where everything uh, can, uh, where humanity can, can live uh, equally and share in the, in property and, profits and have their needs taken care of that's what slavery allows um for for society that's what he's saying now you might think well but communism is slavery and you might be right uh but that again it is part of an ideological coloring through some historical processes that we can't read into this so just keep that in mind. Um, in any case, he uh, wraps up by saying that there is no real war between a master and a slave. Um, the master has every interest uh, in keeping the slave healthy and fed and taken care of and, and all of that. Uh, because if he doesn't, he might lose the slave. Ladies and gentlemen, we know that... Southern slave owners did not treat their slaves kindly. This is a thing that comes up again and again and again in the Southern Defense of Slavery and in The Lost Cause, which we'll talk about in a couple weeks. Slaves were abused. They were beaten. They were killed. They were raped. Every kind of violence happened to slaves. This is just ridiculous. But that's the argument that he and so many other Southerners make, that the slaves were taken care of. No, they weren't. So many of them died. So many of them were abused. There might be one or two that had a good, comfortable life. Maybe. But I doubt it. Like, they lived under the threat of the lash. If they stepped out of line, they were beaten. They could be killed. If they tried to escape, they would be hunted. Like, come on. <laughs> we know that this isn't true. We know it's not true. But again, this is what the, this is what a Southerner is arguing. So, in any case, that's the basic. Um, like this combined with the the Hammond source, that's the basic kind of outline of the Southern defense of slavery. Uh, if you have any questions about George Fitzhugh. Uh, his uh, argument here, feel free to reach out to me via email uh, or in an office hour, and uh, I will see you next week for another primary source walkthrough. Take care, y'all.